So, so far we have looked at a number of different valid and useful use cases corresponding to the macro definitions and we have just touched upon the idea of including files by themselves, right. Now, the idea of include is to go one step beyond the define. As we have already seen in define, what we do is we just do a macro expansion of a particular piece of text and replace it with another piece of text. The include takes that one step further. It basically says that it will treat whatever is the include parameter as the name of a file and bring that whole file in. The entire text of that file is now going to be replaced in here. Now, why would you want to do something like that? There are some fairly interesting use cases of this, right? For example, you might uh, think of writing a particular document, right? Where let's say that you are trying to write a book and you want to split it up into multiple chapters. Now, there are different types of word processors. Many of you are probably used to something like Microsoft Word, where you pretty much write one big document that contains all the text corresponding to the book. But there are other kinds of document processors, such as for example, LaTeX, which is very often used in scientific publishing. And what LaTeX does is it basically encourages you to split the document across multiple files. So that each file contains, let's say one chapter of the book, or possibly even one section of one chapter of a book. Similarly, the images that are present in the file might be present in files of their own and are just included into the main file as required. This allows you to sort of treat the file system as a database that you know, has all of the information in it and you can now focus on any one of the individual files by itself and edit it as required. Okay. Now, the same kind of a thing is also useful in the context of a programming language. You do not want to have one big program which extends into thousands or even hundreds of thousands of lines of code. You would much rather break it up into smaller files, each of which contains a few functions and those functions are then used appropriately in order to get the overall behavior that you expect. So it's possible to include entire files of code in this way, including other C files but this is strongly not advised, right? Uh, there, I have come across a number of instances where people actually write code where you actually hash include one .c file into another. That is problematic on many levels, right? It will cause, it will almost certainly cause problems for you somewhere down the line, even if it works at present, right? So absolutely avoid it if possible. I'll try and give an example of why uh, that is going to cause problems later but it is definitely not something advisable and not something that you would want to see in a general scenario. On the other hand, a typical target for the hash include is what's called a header file. You are already familiar with something like stdio.h, right, which basically includes the printf, scanf kind of functions that we have been using fairly regularly. There is another header file called math.h, which contains a lot of arithmetic operations, not exactly arithmetic, but more the trigonometric and uh, the uh, power operations and things of that sort, right? They could also be used in order to define new data types. And this is another common use for header files. So very often if you have some kind of a complicated struct, what you do is rather than defining it directly in the C file, you define the type def corresponding to the struct in a header file and then include that header file into all the different C files that actually make use of that struct or that type def. That makes it much easier to make a change in one place and have it reflect everywhere, basically. The other thing, as I said, is parameter definitions. For example, pi, although pi is, you know, you don't really want to make it a parameter definition as such. The only reason for doing that would be you want some number of digits of accuracy in the definition of pi and you want that to be constant across all of your uh, computations, right? But there could be other kinds of parameters uh, let's say that you're creating a communication system, then the number of uh, uh, carrier frequencies that you are going to use, the number of bits that need to be transmitted, all of those would end up becoming parameters that you want to define in one central location and use in multiple other places. So in order to demonstrate how exactly including one file from another takes place, I have actually uh, and I, I'm, I'm switching over to the shell 
tab that you see over here rather than the console because I need to type these commands directly at the uh, command line in order to demonstrate them. It's not just as simple as clicking the run button. You actually want to see what is happening behind the scenes when the preprocessor kicks in, right? Uh, I also had to move some of these files into a subfolder called broken and that is partly because of the way that Replit organizes files and compiles them. So in order to understand a little bit more about how the preprocessor handles include files, we are going to use the shell, right, the command line in order to directly run the C preprocessor. Uh, pre and I also had to organize these files into another subfolder which I've called broken because part of the reason for that is if I do not put it in there and rename some of the files, Replit tries to automatically compile them as C files and creates compile errors which I don't really want. So let's first take a look at what's present inside this. I have a few uh, different files over here, right? One of them is this file called inktest.cc. And what you can see is that file, I've, got, I've given it an extension .cc, but that does not make it a C++ file. It's just, it contains some text. And what happens over here is it actually hash includes another file called something.txt. Okay. Now, what's there inside something.txt? If I look at it, it basically says there is some text here and more text. I can also include other files. And then it has another hash include that says another.txt. Right. And the file another.txt just contains one line. So, what we can see is I seem to have a chain out here. Right. I start with inktest.cc. That in turn includes another file. That file has some text in it, but it also seems to be including yet another file until I finally come to that last file, which does not have anything further in it. So what I can do is I can explicitly run the C preprocessor on a file like this. I can basically tell it to CPP, which is the name of the C preprocessor, inktest.cc. Okay. Now what happens is you will see that it actually creates quite a lot of output but let's try and understand exactly what that output is, okay. There are many lines out here that start with just a hash symbol, right? And the interesting thing is that just a hash followed by a space is also a preprocessor directive for C, but interestingly, all that it says is just ignore this preprocessor directive, don't do anything further with it, just leave it there, leave it alone, right? Which means that effectively this is sort of like a comment at the output, right? So what it's telling you is that the CPP com uh, command was run on the file inktest.cc. The first thing it did, did was create an output which just had the name of that line, right? Inktest.cc. It then also has a couple of other lines out here saying built in command line and also saying something about the Nix store and so on. All of this is actually related to the version of the preprocessor itself that we are running out here and has nothing to do with the code or the files that I created, right? Where it finally gets interesting is that after some time, we find that on line one of inktest.cc, we are going to replace that with something.txt. Okay, so that's pretty much what it's telling you over here. And what has it done? It has basically put in this, there is some text here and more text, etc., which is exactly what was there in the first few lines of something.txt, right? There is some text here and more text. This has nothing to do with C, but I can also include other files. All of those, everything, including the spaces, including the new lines, all of it has appeared at the output except this last line, which is the hash include another dot text. Instead of that line hash include another dot text, I find that there is yet another hash, but now it tells me that it's going to be basically replacing it with another dot text. And at that point, what it has done is it has taken the text from here. This is some more blah, but without a hash in front of it, right? And that's it. So it's basically done. Now, as soon as that another dot text, the content of that is over, it goes back into something dot text and basically tells me that it's now on line eight of something dot text. It's got nothing further, further to do over here. It exits something dot text. It goes back to inktest.cc line number two 
right this line number is in front over here it finds that it has nothing further to do and exits so if you think about what has happened over here it basically took this ink test.cc and replaced it with another text file which contains this and this line and as long as whatever other compiler or program or whatever it is knows that it should ignore any line that has a hash followed by a space after it all of those would basically get taken out and would result in only whatever is remaining out here right so it's very easy to sort of do a uh, i mean we could even have something like a grep which basically just eliminates all these unnecessary lines Now, grep is one of those built-in, not built-in, it's one of the standard Linux commands which is pretty much should be there on any Linux system that you encounter. Uh, what grep does is it searches for something called regular expressions or for patterns, right? Uh, and in this case, what we are doing is we wanted to search for all lines that start. In other words, this caret basically means the first first letter or first character on that line is the hash symbol right and grep minus v basically says find all the lines that do not match this what it gives you as a result is only whatever was the expansion of something dot text and another dot text everything put together as one big file out here so hopefully this tells you a little bit about how preprocessor expansion works in the first place right what it did was it took one file it replaced it with the, I mean, it replaced the hash include that it found out here with the contents of some other file, right? And when it found a hash include in that, the contents of that other file, it then went ahead and once again replaced that with that other file and so on. The interesting thing is I could also have done something like this. I could have directly run cpp on something.txt and this also works, right? In fact, if I grep out the lines that I don't want, I find that including the line this is some more blah which came from another dot text has now appeared in the cpp output of something dot text. What happens if I run cpp on a simple file something like another dot text right. I find that it just gives me back the line that I started with. It has not done any text substitution, it has not included any other files right it might still have some comment lines out here right just to tell you that it did something but it has not added or removed anything from the file itself so if there is a hash include then yes it will replace it with something else if there was a hash define it will replace that with something else right so for example we could even go in here and say something like hash define and with but right and now what happens is that when i find the word and i should end up replacing it with the word but and i can try that out on cpp ink test.cc and you see that the and got replaced with the word but right the word but by itself did not get replaced by anything else because that was not a hash defined there was nothing to replace anything else over there so this is kind of interesting basically what it's telling you is that it's recursively going in there finding patterns that you have defined in one place applying them repeatedly okay so this is the general process of an include file all it does is expand out the file that you have so when you do something like hash include stdio.h you are literally pulling in a whole lot of extra text into your simple small main.c. So you might have written a four line code for printf hello world, but with a hash include stdio.h in the beginning. And what happens as a result is it ends up just expanding that out into a huge big file that has a large number of lines. Now, there is one more file over here, which you might notice is called record.cc right 
And what record.cc does is it includes record.cc, right? So what happens out here? What do we expect when we run CPP on record.cc? It ends up, ah, okay. So this is a problem. I need to include record.cc uh, and not C, right? I had originally tested it out with just the word C, but that was causing problems with uh, the replit compilation. So I changed it to record.cc. What you can see, of course, is that, you know, the hash include actually tried. It tried to find a file called record.c, did not find it, and it terminated immediately. But now that I have fixed the file name in there, what happens when I run the CPP? Something strange, right? I mean, there's a whole lot of stuff that got printed out. You can see that it just seems to be the same thing getting printed again and again and again. And if you pay attention, of course, what you will realize is that, you know, effectively what has happened out here is that we ended up with a recursion that exceeded the maximum depth, the stack depth that we are permitted in a recursion in the CPP preprocessor. And that is why it basically generated an error and got out. So what it tried to do was, you know, it kept trying to include record.cc. After doing it, I guess, 200 times, because that is what it reports as the depth over here. After having done this 200 times, it basically decided that this has become a problem. You could give it an extra flag in order to increase that maximum, but in this case, that's obviously meaningless because we know that this is an endless recursion. We just want to try it out, right? And it tries to exit the recursion. And basically, once again, 200 times, it prints out what it has generated so far, right? Which is not particularly helpful or meaningful because in this case was just a flat recursion. Right? So recursion can be used and this is in fact how it works. Where it becomes useful is the fact that I can include a file that includes another file that defines something else that includes something else and so on and it would go through and repeatedly do all of those. The problem happens when I try to do recursion especially since I don't have a nice exit clause out here. I don't have a way of preventing this from happening. I could probably use a hash if def or something like that in order to make this actually perform a computation. But that's not particularly helpful. It's basically saying that I'm going to do some kind of a complicated recursive computation at compile time, which is sort of defeating the purpose of what a compiler is meant to do. Right? So this can be done. It's not advisable, but you need to be aware of what happens if you try to do it.